Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, we are going to keep it pretty chill, simple, and informative. At the same time, we are going to be potting up a few imports I got a couple of days ago that's currently sitting in water right now. And we either need to change the water that they're currently in or pot them up in a potting medium. And I've already kind of started doing a few of them. So we do have a few of the Syndapsis Silver Lady. I did just pot this one up in Spagnum Moss. And we are gonna be doing some silver cloud that you guys see here. I love this dark variation, as well as a few Syndapsis Platinum that you guys see right here. So while we do that, I'm gonna share with you guys the entire importing process. Everything from the import permits and documentations you'll need to the different type of sellers you're gonna come across and how they choose the right ones, the payment options available, packaging and tracking the plants, and what do you do if your plants are DOA, dead on arrival. So obviously I'm gonna share with you guys my experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to importing houseplants. But before we dive into each of those areas, let's touch a little bit on reasons why you should import houseplants. I think the number one reason is it does give you an opportunity to acquire or source out a lot more of these rare, uncommon, or wishlist type of plants that you typically won't find at your local big box stores or garden center. In addition, they're also gonna cost like half or even less than that than what you would typically pay for if you were to find them at a specialty uh, plant shop in your area. So those are probably the number two reasons why people import houseplants. So I'm gonna pot up another Silver Lady. Look how beautiful the foliage is on this. At first, I wasn't sure on this when I just see pictures and videos, but seeing it in person, very, very beautiful. Uh, and then I'm gonna put a layer of sphagnum moss, damp sphagnum moss in this four inch container. And similar to like any potting medium, you know, place my plant in there and then top it up with some more sphagnum moss. So now let's talk a little bit on reasons why you shouldn't import house plants. I think there's a lot more reasons to not import plants versus reasons to import plants. I guess it really depends on your needs, wants, and your tolerance for risk. There is a lot of risk involved when it comes to importing houseplants, everything from the number of sellers or different type of sellers you're gonna come across, the payment methods available to you, the packaging of those plants, the shipping of those plants, you know, sometimes you may get lucky and they may arrive a day early or on time, or sometimes you'll experience delays like a week, two, three, sometimes four weeks delay, and the odds are those plants are gonna be dead. And then if they do come, you know, somewhat relatively healthy, a lot of them will be bruised. You do have to go through the stage of rehabbing and acclimating your plants and getting them to a place where they are thriving and healthy in their new environment. So definitely a lot of stress, not only for the plants that they go through when you are importing plants, but also a lot of stress personally and emotionally for you, especially if you get a bit of anxious or anxiety when it comes to your plants. And like I said, if you don't have a high risk tolerance, it's definitely not something you wanna explore. Also, if you are relatively new in your plant journey or you're just a new plant parent and you don't necessarily have the experience when it comes to rehabbing or acclimating your house plants, uh, I would say to definitely not uh, you know, import plants because it is sometimes going to be very difficult to acclimate plants. Um, sometimes you'll get perfectly healthy plants with beautiful roots, you know, but sometimes you're going to get leaves that are yellow or dying off or bruised. And if you, that's not something you want, then <laughs> do not import houseplants. So uh, those are some of the reasons why you shouldn't import houseplants. But now let's touch a bit on the process on how you go about importing plants. So first up is permits and documentations you're gonna need. Now I live here in Canada, but the process between Canada and US is very, very similar. So for those of you guys who live in the US, you simply have to go to aphis.usda.gov, I think. I'm gonna put it right here. And then if you're in Canada, you have to go to your food inspection agency, which is inspection.canada.ca and simply follow the process on applying for an import permit. And very, very easy to do, just follow the instructions. I think in the US, it might be free. And I think in Canada, it either costs $25 or $35. I don't remember what I paid for. But you also have the option of applying for a permit as an individual or for commercial and business reasons. So those are kind of the options you have when it comes to uh, you know applying for a permit. And within a couple of weeks, you should get a response. I think mine only took about maybe 10 days at most. So you're definitely gonna wanna get an import permit. And when you do work with experienced sellers, they're gonna ask for this. So very, very important for you to get a permit. I think in the US, you technically don't need one if you're importing plants that are 12 or less, 
But to be on the safe side, just get one so that way you save yourself the headache because there's gonna be a lot of stages where it's gonna cause you some headaches as well. So that is definitely the one thing you're gonna need. So the next piece of document you're gonna need with your package is a phytosanitary certificate. And this is issued by the exporting country, the plant you know, protection organization that pretty much certifies and states that the plant that you are importing is free of pests, diseases, or contamination and meets the entry requirement of that importer country so it meets the US requirements or the Canadian requirement. And this typically will cost uh, you like $25 to $50 depending on the seller or depending on the amount of plants you're getting. So that is definitely gonna come with your plant package. The other document that's gonna come with your plant package is a invoice that states the kind of plants that's in that plant package, the quantity and the dollar value. That dollar value is needed I don't know if it, this is requirement for the US, but I know in Canada, you need to declare the value on goods that you are importing and there will be duties and taxes that you're gonna have to pay on uh, your shipment. So that is something that you're going to need uh, with your plant package. And then the last document you're gonna need is the way bill or tracking of your plant package. And before your plant package is shipped out by any seller, make sure you have a copy of each of these documents in the event that you need to produce them for the custom agency or the brokerage, depending on how you wanna clear your plants. And if you don't have them and it's daytime here, you're trying to get a hold of your you know, seller to send you copies of the phytosanitary certificate or the invoice or packaging list, then uh, you're gonna have a hard time. It's just gonna delay your plants from getting you know, in your hands. So, Definitely a recommendation is make sure you have a copy of each of these documents. Now let's touch a little bit on the different type of sellers you're gonna come across and how to choose the right ones. So there's definitely a lot more sellers, um, especially in the last you know year and a half or two years that kind of just popped up. And the good thing about having a lot of sellers is you have options on the different type of plants you can get, as well as you know maybe pricing maybe a little bit more favorable to you. You can negotiate a little bit more. Maybe you have better shipping options, uh, payment methods, and so on. The bad thing about having so many sellers is you're gonna have to weed through a lot of garbage before you find the right one for you. And uh, trust me, it can be quite stressful because uh, there are a lot of different types of sellers you may come across. There's some that are a little bit more established. Uh, these guys usually have a website. Uh, they can take a credit card payment online. They grow their own plants. Established nursery has been around for years. Uh, places like greenspace.id or Equigenera, which I think is in uh, Ecuador or South America. Those are fairly established growers and nurseries and you can buy plants from them and pay online and uh, they have experience shipping, packaging the plants. So uh, for the most part, uh, you may have a really good experience with them. I personally have never bought from them so I can't say or speak personally for it, but I know a lot of creators out there has bought plants from them and they've had some good experiences. So those are a little bit more of the established ones. There's also sellers that you're gonna find so this is a Syndapsis Platinum. Look at the beautiful leaves on this one. If you like silver or platinum type of plants, <laughs> then this one is for you. Now, there's also sellers like on Etsy. Um, and Etsy consists of established, experienced sellers and some that are not experienced <laughs> and uh, you know uh, may not have the best reviews. So good thing about Etsy is you can actually check out the reviews. So I uh, definitely use that as a reference point. There's also a lot more of these mom and pop independent type of sellers that you can find on Facebook or Instagram. You know, when you often get that message, hey friend, I got a lot of plans for you. So uh, those are the type of sellers you're gonna come across. Sometimes you'll come across like an exporter. So an exporter is someone who doesn't necessarily grow their own plants, but they are connected around you know, the area and they know all of these nurseries who may not have experience exporting plants. So they are kind of that company uh, who will get the phytosanitary certificate for you source out the plants for you and uh, you know have the each nursery grower package them and then the exporter will put them in a box and then ship them out. I guess the pros of working with an exporter is you possibly can get the plants a little bit cheaper uh, even though they are taking a cut because they still have to go to a source. The bad thing about working with an exporter is they don't really care about the plants, so you're gonna often experience them just rushing, trying to get the deal done, uh, and you know, trying to get plants shipped out. And you know, sometimes you're gonna find that the plants you're gonna get, in most cases from my experience, they are not in good shape and they are not in good health. So that is something that you wanna keep an eye on, is um, you know, just make sure that you vet the seller. So with so many sellers out there, how do you go about choosing the right one, or how do you kind of weed out the bad sellers from the good ones? I think the first thing you want to establish is determine your 
appetite for that plant, your risk tolerance, and uh, how much you're you know, willing to kind of lose uh, versus what you're not willing to lose. Once you kind of establish that, then at least you're able to navigate through which sellers you're more willing to work with and which ones you aren't. But regardless which way you go, I think there's a few things you need to keep in mind. First up, I would say is communication. It is very important to find a seller where you guys can communicate really, really well with each other, where you understand them clearly and they understand you clearly. Uh, oftentimes, there's gonna be a bit of language barrier, so you may experience a bit of broken English and maybe some misunderstanding. So it's important to be direct, use simple words, and ultimately just find someone who can communicate really, really well with you. And you know, how you kind of go through that is you know, when you start doing your due diligence and asking the right questions, then you're able to determine whether um, that person is a good communicator or not. So when it comes to your due diligence, what are the questions you should ask? You know, ask them, do they have any experience you know, exporting their plants to your country? You know, ask them what their steps are or what the process is. How long does a phytosanitary certificate take? You know, how do they go about packaging the plants? get video footage or FaceTime there or video call them to show them the plants that you're interested in. You know, they can give you a tour of their nursery. This is also a great way to determine whether they are the actual grower or uh, they're an exporter. Um, you know, ask them about the plants. You know, do they know their plants? Also another way to tell whether they care about their plants or they are actually the, the grower versus someone who's just maybe you know, uh, exporting and uh, building sales for a nursery. So, Lots of questions to ask before you really determine if that's a seller for you. So I finished packing up another Syndapsis Platinum. I'm now gonna do this silver cloud that you guys see here. This is so beautiful. I did not see this one coming. I was expecting more of the lighter green, which I already have, but this is kind of a dark uh, variation of it and the leaves look so good. And then you see here the roots, how beautiful and long and white they are. So barely any rotting on it. You know, I wish every single plant I got in a package came like this, but unfortunately that's not the case and that's not what you're gonna experience. Sometimes there's gonna be a lot of bruising or yellowing and you know sometimes the roots are gonna be brown or a bit of rotting on it. So once you've established kind of the right seller for you and you're ready to choose your plants and all of that, you're gonna come across the payment options or methods that your seller's gonna you know, give you. Good sellers will offer you PayPal goods and services. The ones that are a little bit more independent will offer PayPal, but sending it as a friend. And most sellers will actually encourage you to send it as a friend because it costs them very little money on their end and PayPal will not hold the funds. By sending it through goods and services, PayPal will typically hold the funds and sellers you know, don't like that because they may have to pay you know, someone else, whether it's a shipping company or, you know, and this is how you know if it's gonna be an exporter is they need to pay the nursery and whatnot. So definitely opt in for paying by you know, goods and services. If you pay by goods and services and you get plants that are you know, not what you expected or they're dead on arrival or you, know, you didn't get them in time, whatever the case may be, there is a recourse for you to get your money back through PayPal's guarantees. Now, if you send as a friend, I don't think there's recourse on getting your money back or getting a refund because you sent it as a friend. So those are something to keep in mind. I've sent it both, I'm gonna be honest, and whew, it is so <laughs> risky and scary. And for the most part, you're gonna have to sometimes take a bit of faith and a bit of risk, right? So my risk tolerance was a lot higher than I would say the average person. But regardless what your risk tolerance is, always pay by PayPal goods and services. If they push you on sending as a friend, say no. If they push you to send it through Western Union, say no, which I've also done. And if they push to send it through bank wire and drafts, say no, because in all of those payment methods, sending as a friend through PayPal, uh, Western Union or wire transfer through bank, you have no recourse in getting a refund. So keep that in mind when it comes to the payment options that are provided to you by the sellers. Now let's touch a little bit on the shipping options available to you. So most experienced sellers will either give you the option of sending it through DHL or the US Postal Service, USPS, or they can give you the air cargo option. DHL and USPS is I think gonna cost anywhere between like 125 to 175. It really depends on how large the box is or how many plants you're getting. And air cargo is usually two times that cost, sometimes 300 bucks, 350. Again, depends on the size of the package or the weight of it. Now with DHL um, and USPS, I, again, I've only experienced DHL here in Canada. I've gotten the plants as early as like three days, uh, usually averages about five days, but I've also gotten it as late as 10 days. 
You can imagine how the plants would look like if they came in three days versus, you know, 10 days. I've gone as far as my plants being stuck in the DHL warehouse uh, for about 20 days. Uh, partly because they had an emergency and they had to shut down, even though it already passed customs and cleared it. It was just a matter of getting it to my house, but because of unforeseen events, it got stuck there. And unfortunately, I couldn't do anything about it. So uh, that is the only thing when it comes to working with DHL USPS is you also don't have control because at the end of the day, the courier is in their hands. And you know, if they deliver it on time, great. But if something happens in their warehouse, package gets lost, then you're pretty much... Um, stressing yourself out, which I've done. So that is the only thing when it comes to working with DHL and USPS. Now with Air Cargo, it pretty much is shipped to you as soon as a day and a half to two and a half days. So pretty much they put it in an airplane with the rest of you know people who are importing and you usually will have to pick this up at the airport. So that's the only thing about with DHL is usually it's delivered to you right to your door. You don't have to go to the airport or deal with customs. Uh, DHL usually has a brokerage team that will work and deal with customs to clear your package on your behalf. The only thing with that is there's a fee for it. I don't know if that's the case in the US if you have to declare the plants, but here in Canada, you have to declare them. And if you are not experienced when it comes to declaring plants and going to the airport and dealing with customs, filling out the paperwork, then going to the warehouse and picking up your plants, then <laughs> do not go down the air cargo route. The advantage with air cargo is you have more control on when your plants get here. As soon as they arrive in Canada, you can literally go to the airport, do the paperwork, clear it from custom and bring it home. So those are kind of the shipping options that some sellers will, you know, uh, provide you, but really up to you again on your risk tolerance and what you're willing to take. So I packed up another uh, Syndaps Silver Cloud here. So we got, I think I got about 20 each of the Platinum, the Silver Lady and the Syndapses. All of these plants are for my shop that is uh, opening in around like August. So I'm excited for it. So now let's touch a little bit on the packaging of the plants and most experienced sellers will time when to package the plant based on when the courier is gonna pick up the plant package or when it's being shipped out. And the packaging of plants involves a lot of things. So you can imagine the stress that a lot of these plants go through. First up is they need to, you know, unpot them from the pot they're grown in, uh, remove all the dirt, clean them, wash them, sanitize them, then package them gently. Usually the leaves and the foliages will be wrapped in a soft uh, paper and then the roots will be covered in kind of a damp or moist tissue and then covered in saran wrap to kind of seal a bit of that moisture. So that way the roots doesn't dry out completely. And then they'll put them in a styrofoam box, uh, tape them up, put all your paper and documentations around that box. That styrofoam will help protect the plants from both the cold and the hot temperatures that they'll typically experience when they are, you know, flying over to you. So that's typically how the plants will be packaged. Now, Again, there's so many things that can influence how the plants will look when they arrive to you. Everything from the quality of the plant to begin with, to how it's packaged, to how it is shipped, to how long they've been sitting in that styrofoam box and how soon you get them. Um, when you get plants that are dead on arrival, so dead on arrival means the roots are pretty much rotted. There is no roots at all, or the rotting is already kind of going through the stem, which eventually is unlikely for the plant to even survive any acclimation and rehab process. Uh, in that case, you can you know, go to your seller and ask them to replace those plants. From my experience, most sellers will replace the plants. So what you wanna do is if you are getting those types of plants is you wanna make sure you're taking a picture or you know, doing a unboxing video <laughs> of the plants so that way you can send uh, the way the plants look when you first open it up to your uh, seller or grower. And then that way uh, they can take a tally and uh, replace the plants. Now, the only thing when it comes to replacing these plants is, you know, sometimes the seller will replace it on your next order. So you're kind of forced to make another order. And usually you're gonna pay for the shipping fees again. Um, sometimes you may be able to push back, you know, it really does depend on your grower and seller, but I typically have always had to pay for my shipping again when it comes to replacing the plants. And because you are paying for shipping again, you know, you're sometimes tempted to order more plants. So it really does depend on, on again, your risk tolerance and what you're willing to do to take. Um, so that's what happens when you do get plants that are dead on arrival. Now you will also get some plants that, you know, has a nice healthy root system, but like I said, the leaves are yellowing or they're bruised. Sometimes 
certain plants bruise a lot more than others. Now that's something to definitely keep in mind, but if the plant has healthy root system, but a few like bruised leaves or yellowing, that's normal. You know, that's just part of the shipping process. So in that case, you're not gonna be able to replace that. Um, again, if you're looking for perfectly healthy plants, importing is not for you. So just keep that in mind. So overall, that's pretty much kind of the step or the process when it comes to importing houseplants. The only thing I would probably say is certain plants travel better than others. From my experience, I found surprisingly ethereums like all the ethereums I've ever imported traveled really, really well. Syndapsis are good depending on the type of syndapsis. Like for example, this silver cloud traveled well, it was beautiful, but the previous silver cloud I got from another seller, which again, the different type of seller, the way they package can also impact the quality of the plants, is they did not travel well. Even though I got both of them within like two days, a lot of yellowing, the foliage has kind of dropped. The way they packaged it was really bad and it was rough. All those plants were pretty much a write-off for me. Syndapsis like the True BI Dark Form or Moonlight, I found they traveled really well, almost perfect. Uh, Syngoniums is a bit of a mixed bag. Again, I think that also goes back to the different type of sellers you may come across. I have multiple sellers I buy from. So, uh, and even the good ones, like I've had good experience. Sometimes the second batch you get from them are like bad. I think it goes back to really establishing good communication and good relationship with your seller to make sure that, you know, your expectation lines up with, uh, you know, what they're able to provide and uh, vice versa and whatnot. So that's pretty much it when it comes to importing houseplants. Comment below and let me know if we should do an acclimation process video because that's something definitely I didn't touch on. I did a bit of it here, you know, usually the first 48 hours I just like to put them in water and then put them in a greenhouse and let them sit there for a bit and then from there there's a bit of stages that they go through in order for them to be available and ready to be rehomed or, you know, put in my living room for me to enjoy. But um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and found it helpful. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your week and we'll see you guys soon. Peace.